Hello students, this is a brief talk on the four senses of scripture, and those would be smell, touch, taste, and sight. Oh, just kidding. The four senses of scripture begin with the literal sense, and we're going to talk about what all these senses mean. I just want to give you a quick overview right at the beginning. So there's the literal sense, and then there's the spiritual sense, and there are three flavors of spiritual sense. One is the allegorical, the second is the moral, and the fourth is the anagogical. These methods of interpretation were all used by the church fathers, and these were the uh, men, the great figures in Christianity in the first few centuries, who really filled out the theological tradition and formed the basis of what we now have as, as Christian theology. So meditating on the Word of God and trying to apply it to various situations, bringing in also knowledge from the sciences and philosophy to help put together a coherent picture of the Christian faith. And they recognized right from the very beginning that there are multiple senses and multiple meanings in Scripture. St. Thomas Aquinas himself accepted their use of these multiple senses and incorporated it into his own work. Now the first and most easily, con most easily confused sense of Scripture is the literal sense. And we don't really know what the word literal means these days, especially when applied to biblical studies. So literal does not mean literalist. So, for example, there's a famous English poet, John Donne, who in his Holy Sonnets starts one of his poems with this line, Batter my heart, three-personed God. Now, when he's saying to God, batter my heart, it's obvious that he means, you know, God, convert me, you know, make me a good person. He doesn't mean what punk is doing here to the rock. That's not the kind of battering that he has in mind. So, this is the literalist sense, but the literal sense of what John Donne is saying is, convert me. Or take, for example, when a football coach says to his team, now get out there and kick their butts. I, I don't think he normally means this, like that you actually get out on the field and you press your foot against the opponent's behind. That's not the literal sense of what the coach means. What the coach literally means is beat them, win. So the literal sense, in truth, is actually what we might call the historical sense. That's the best way to think about it. What did it mean in history to the person at the time? To John Donne, the poet, batter my heart means convert me. To the football coach, kick, kick some butt means win. That's what it means in the historical context, all right? And everybody understands that. So in scripture, then, the, the literal interpretation means what did this passage mean to the guy or girl who wrote it back in history? How did they understand it at the time it was written? And so for that, you need to study history. You need to study uh, ancient languages, you know, to, to really pick up on all the nuance of that. That can really add to the richness of the literal sense. So let's look at a few examples just for clarification. So in Genesis 1 and 2, how should we read this? Now, again, we have these two creation stories side by side, and they're obviously very different. In Genesis 1, Adam and Eve are created together on the sixth day. But in Genesis 2, man comes first. Then you get plants, animals, a whole lot of other stuff, and finally Eve. So they're not, they're not telling the exact same story, obviously, side by side. So how do we read them? What did it mean, when we're looking for the literal sense, the question is, what did it mean for the guy who wrote this at the time? Did he read this? Did he want Genesis to be read like a newspaper? Did he want it read like a science textbook? Did he want it read like a critical biography of Adam and Eve? Or did he want it read like an ancient Middle Eastern origin story, which is a particular type of story that other people would have been familiar with? You know, you had Babylon and Assyrian and Egyptian origin stories. You know, every culture has their own origin story. And, and Genesis is providing kind of these two versions put together of an origin story for the Jewish people. And there's a way to read that. And that way, that's the literal sense of Genesis 1 and 2. Because you're asking, how would the person... 3,000 years ago or whenever, how would the person who wrote this 3,000 years ago, what were they thinking? How did they understand it? That is the literal sense. So let's, another example, 3,000 years ago when, when somebody in the, is writing down in the biblical text talking about God's arm, do they mean literally like God has a physical arm? Or did they just mean God's power and they're using this literary device uh, to talk about God's power? Okay, it's the second one. The second one, God's power, is the literal sense of the text. It's not big muscles like we've got over here on the right side of the screen. That's not the literal sense. That's the literalist sense of the term. And that would be this, literalist. That's not the right way to read scripture.
Okay, so we're going for the literal sense, what it means for the person at the time. And now let's talk about the other senses of Scripture. So there's also a spir the spiritual senses of Scripture. Now, why do these exist? I mean, if the human author is writing one thing and it means something to, to him, why do we have other senses? Well, simple. There are two authors of Scripture. There's a human author who has something in his or her head, and the divine author who has other meanings also that, that, uh, that he's bringing to the text. The human author might not be aware of all those. You know, he's just doing what he's inspired to do. But God has him, in his mind other things as well. So God is not just the author of, of the Bible. He's also the author of history itself. And he knows what's coming down the track. So he's, he's giving us hints in the Old Testament of what's kind of coming forward in the New. So that's why there's a spiritual sense of Scripture because, well, there's more than one author. So you can have a spiritual sense. It's kind of like God's sense of it. All right. So... The first that we can look at, the first spiritual sense, is the allegorical sense. And typological means symbolic. And you think of type. You know, uh, you, look, you might look at someone and say, oh, they're the, they're the type of person who would do that. You know, they're the, they're the type of person who would, you know, run over an old lady. They're the type of person who would give money to a homeless person. All right. Which means there's the, the set I, idea that this person conforms to. Okay. So scripture has types too. And so we can talk about Noah's Ark as a type of the church. Noah's Ark is where the good people and all the animals go in to be saved during the great flood. And that's a type of the church. So we have this procession of church of Christians going into the church in St. Mark's uh, Square. So Noah, Noah's Ark is kind of like a sneak preview of, of the church. They, they serve the same function. It's all part of like, you know, how does God save this group of people who are his own? You know, another example of the allegorical sense might be the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant is this uh, item, you know, it has in it the Ten Commandments and the Staff of Moses and some of the manna that fell from heaven. And it's the holiest thing for the Jewish people. I mean, it's, it's where God is most present to them. Kind of like Mary is for Christians, that within her, she carries within herself this presence of God, just as the Ark carried within it, it or signified God's most intense presence on the earth. So Mary, because she's the mother of God uh, himself, carries within her this super presence of God. So the Ark of the Covenant is a type of Mary. She's the real thing, and the Ark is something that's pointing to her. And there's also obviously a moral sense to Scripture. This is probably the easiest to understand. So in Numbers 21, there's a story, you know, the people are wandering, the Jewish people are wandering in the wilderness, they're complaining to God, God gets angry, serpents uh, come into the camp, they bite a bunch of people, and the people are like, oops, we made a mistake, Moses, do something. So Moses talks to God, God says, hey, set up this, uh, make a bronze serpent and set it up on a pole, and if anybody looks at the pole, uh, they'll be cured of their, of their serpent bite. Okay. Well, the moral sense, I mean, I've got a couple here. One is, don't complain against God. But also the moral sense would be, look towards Christ. Because looking towards Christ in the cross is what heals us. Now, interesting thing, there's also a typological sense. So, the, the seraph serpent on the pole is a type of Jesus. And there's also a moral to this story as well, that looking at God, looking at God's suffering on the cross, is the medicine for what cures us, or for what ails us. So, um, so we, we have a, two senses in this example here. Okay. The final sense is the anagogical sense. And this is the story that relate, how the story relates to our eternal destiny. From the Greek, anagoge, uh, ana, anagog, sorry, means literally leading upwards. So how do the stories in scripture lead us up towards heaven? Lead us towards the last things? So when God frees the Hebrew people from Egypt, he leads them from this land of sin and death to the land of sinlessness and eternal life, and that's heaven. And so that when God does that action for the Hebrew people, he's pointing to what he's going to do at the very end of time to all his faithful ones. And those, ladies and gentlemen, are the senses of Scripture. We have the literal sense and then under the spiritual sense, there's the symbolic or allegorical, there's the moral, and the anagogical.